Inside the Birds is back. What's going on, everybody? It's Jeff Mosher and Adam Kaplan for a very special South Florida edition of Inside the Birds. And that's because Adam and I are both here in the Miami area. And we were both at the Wednesday joint session, which I thought was really, I don't know. I mean, Adam, I'll let you talk about it in a second, but I really enjoyed this session. I thought it was very competitive. Uh, it was interesting to see the clash of contrast between what the Dolphins do defensively mm -hmm. and offensively and what the Eagles do offensively and defensively. And by the way, it was really, 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 really freaking hot. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into that. It's a, that's, we don't usually talk about whether to practice. It actually sets the whole thing up on yeah. Wednesday, and, and we'll be at practice in a couple hours today. It's going to be a scorcher, and I call it tropical humidity. It's different from what we have in Philly. Yep. It's it's uh it's very it's heavier. Soupy. The yes, air is exactly. heavier. Yeah. yeah, yeah, soupy as I call it. So, and I didn't know this. I mean, I, I it's funny because in Jacksonville, it's usually terrible. It wasn't terrible when I was there a couple weeks ago. Tampa was okay, but uh, we we got a break when the uh, the PR staff from the Dolphins said, "Oh, you, by the way, uh, see the stands over there." You could sit there if you want, and it's covered. All right, we'll try it. And man, what a lifesaver! It's like twenty degrees cooler there. Yeah. And speaking of lifesavers, <laughs> you you saved our life a little bit. You don't even realize it, but uh -huh. I'll bring it up now. Uh -oh. So those who are watching this on YouTube are just basically seeing our backgrounds of where we're staying. We were hoping to do something together with palm trees behind us and give <laughs> people a little fl flavor of of Miami. Uh, after practice but then you said I don't even know if you realize this you said you know what let's wait until the night time to do the pod because you just never know a trade might happen or something and we don't want to record early and then have to go redo it all yeah. because the trade happened and you were like Nostradamus man because <laughs> a trade happened that we'll get into but the Eagles obviously made a very what a strange trade trading Ugo Amadi just about 10 days after they acquired him in a trade. So we'll get into that too. But um, thankfully, Adam, we did wait because then we would have had to redo everything and that yeah. wouldn't have been pleasant for anybody. No, and then they're not done. I mean, no team's really done. These, these, these teams are all talking to, with each other. Right. Man, a lot of like, there have been probably six or seven trades over the last week in the NFL. Most mm -hmm. of the names you wouldn't recognize and that's kind of where we're at. Now, you mentioned Ugo Amadi. Uh, who was a draft pick of the of Seahawks. And it's just just funny how the, this went down. He just got there last week for the Eagles. <laughs> Another trading, which tells you he wasn't going to make the team. Right. Uh, he, he played a ton of it against Cleveland. When I say a ton, he played enough to get a look at him. And... He played, you know, he played 33 snaps, 27 no. defense, six special. That's not small for a preseason. No, it's league. a lot. I, mean, <laughs> I guess this is his tryout. I, we didn't know that at the time, but... He got. He tried out. You know. He. You know, we. We. We noted uh, in our intel on this trade, the like five or six things we learned uh, from our sources that Pete Carroll was not a fan of uh, Amadi. Too small. He's power. He's power packed. Short arms. Can't play outside corner. Strictly nickel. You could play him at. A, you could play him at slot corner. You could play him at free safety. Mm -hmm. And clearly, what they saw was not good enough. So what the Eagles did is they moved up around. They swapped picks in the twenty four draft. It's a Mahdi, it's seventh round or 24, and the Eagles move up, uh, they get a round, they get the Titans sixth round pick. So, boy, J.J. Ortega-Whiteside getting all sorts of compensation back for the Eagles. Unbelievable. Um, I, I think by next pod, we should try to get a little, we will, we'll get more information on this because it just, like you said, it probably portends another move coming. Oh, yeah. But one of the reasons we thought, the well, trial. Two, of, two of the reasons we thought, Ugo Amadi would make the team is one it's not a it's not an area of tremendous depth for the Eagles so um they they clearly targeted him because they traded for him and two for what you mentioned is that he has some versatility he's able to play nickel he's able to play safety and the what kind of defense that Jonathan Gannon is trying to run he's not looking for big box safety he's looking for Ugo Amadi types so the fact that he was only here 10 days is pretty interesting. So we'll have to we'll get in on that. But well, yeah, they must not, clearly you, not have liked what they saw. No, they didn't. It's, I mean, it's obvious. You were not okay. trading guy. You you just traded for him. You played him a ton of snaps. You you have the coaching tape. You've had practice. You just mm -hmm. trade him. Clearly, they didn't like it. Wow, so that's that, amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. I, I'm 
a little surprised by this, only in that you, you've given up, you, 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 you were that down on the guy, you, you, based on what they got, they, they didn't want him. Okay, they did move up around, mm-hmm. okay, in two years from now, not 23. <laughs> Which is also interesting. You know, it's just funny how God, you guys, you, you, these teams couldn't do it for 23 picks. Not after 24, no, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, Jimmy Moreland was, we should mention, who had the ankle injury. Uh, he was yes. waived off IR with the injury settlement. So uh, they could get him back uh, in the second half of the season if they wanted him back. But the fact of the matter is, he's not going to be an Eagle now. So, uh, which is typical what happens. Guys that you have little interest in uh, now who are on IR, you reach injury settlement. Uh, and then they go on their merry way. Mm-hmm. Uh, a guy that they really liked for a couple of years, and he just, uh, you know, unfortunately got hurt. But to tell you the truth, he didn't make a mark uh, before he got hurt. So this is they were they were hoping to have competition for McPherson, and it just did not transpire. No, it did not. All right, let's get into some things uh, first. I, I want to remind everybody. We've got two big, uh, you know, pieces of news to give, and that's one. We gave one of them out. Uh, no, both of them out. Last pod, we are going to be back on 97.5 The Fanatic this fall, starting September 12th. Most of our shows will be from 6 to 8 p.m. In fact, I think all of our September shows will definitely be from 6 to 8 because yes. the Sixers and Flyer schedules do not conflict. So that is a great news for us. We're able to be in our, in our normal time slot, Monday, 6 through 8, starting September 12th. Please on call. The fanatic. call in, call in, call in. Yep. Listen, if listen, you don't have to live in the Philadelphia area. If you're from Wisconsin, if you're from Texas, if you're from Arkansas, you can just listen on the app or the website, 975thefanatic.com. Uh, and also, uh, we mentioned the last time, we're doing a live show in Fishtown yeah. that will be on August 31st. So it'll be in about six days from now, I guess. Um, with Jason Avant, it'll be an ITV TV live stream at the um it's the i can't remember the name of the park it's a new park with a a really cool trolley in it that they've renovated and there'll be uh it's free to come see us and um it's on uh frankfurt ave and at some point i'll i'll get the address here and remember it um but it's going to be an awesome time and again jason we haven't had on our show in quite a while so the mural city garden that that's what it's called so if you uh Google Mural City Garden in Fishtown, uh, you will find it and um, we'll have a great time. And, you know, Jason's chomping at the bit to get back with us. Can't wait. uh, It's 2211 Frankfurt Ave, by the way, for those uh, who can make it. And we're, we're, we're going to, we're close. We're not there yet. We're to make an announcement for a pregame show. And then we're working on a postgame show deal. Yep. And not, we've got two other things cooking, folks. We, we this is you know this has been quite the last couple of weeks for Jeff and I and uh, Josh Weinfeld, our business manager, and everyone else who works with us. This always happens in August. You know, you, you're trying to get things done, and people are not ready to make a decision, and then everything's like, okay, yeah, let's do this with you guys. Okay, great. Right, so, and then the calendar fills up. Right. So we're we're trying to we're working through it, and we cannot wait to see you guys uh, this fall. And, and also, as you said. Uh, that trolley picture. Did you put that on Twitter? You, you, that picture. I incredible. thought so. I'll I'll do it uh, tomorrow. Yeah, it's by, so by cool. Morgan. And special yeah. thanks to our buddy Mark Colazzo from uh, the this Fishtown BID Business District. Yes. Yes, Business Improvement District does a great job, and the whole thing, they put on great shows. So please uh, come out and see us at the Mural City Garden. Uh, also, everything that we've been doing here in South Florida and leading up to it, we've got on the website, insidethebirds.com. We had our observations piece from Wednesday's practice, so check that out. Andrew Checo is going to be writing uh, some things to watch for in Saturday's preseason game. And then um, we are going to have our, our, uh, long, our anticipated 53-man roster projection coming out next week on insidethebirds.com as well. So check that uh, when you can. All right. Um, so we kind of talked about the trade already of Ugo Amadi to the Titans. Uh, so the Eagles, let, let's talk about safety here, Adam, because I, I think you and I have the same <laughs> thought, which is this has to mean some kind of move is coming at that position, which I think both of us have felt for a while that Howie is going to do something because they're, they're back to sort of square one. You know, they don't have enough bodies and there's just not enough talent there. Yeah, the former's the issue, the talent. So we, we've heard, you and I have exchanged notes for about a week and a half. We know they're working on it. 
They're trying mm -hmm. to do something in safety, whatever that winds up being, whether it's signing the street free agent, whether it's making a trade, whatever it may be. And it may not happen until after the 53, it may not happen until after week one when they, if they sign a veteran, so they don't have to fully guarantee the contract for the season. One mm -hmm. way or the other, they're trying to do something. We'll see what happens. Uh, we know our report back in, what was that, May about Chuck Clark? Uh, they're just a brief talk with the Ravens. They, they weren't interested right. at that point. But right. all I can tell you is Chuck Clark's better than anyone they have other than Marcus Epps. <laughs> I <would> agree. <laughs> I don't know. I, I throw my hands up with a safety position. They've, done, they've had such a great offseason, but this is the one where I see, you know, they're taking a shot with the kid they just traded, Amadi. They got him, then they traded him away. It's like uh, churning out the safeties. <laughs> they're yeah. looking for him. So. Well, the, the amazing thing is that, um, you know, Josiah Scott had the hamstring injury, so he wasn't even practicing Wednesday. I don't know if he'll be, uh, he'll be there, you know, when, when yeah. they have a practice Thursday. And they still sent uh, Amadi away and, and left themselves a little thin at the position. So, yeah, I mean, we'll have to see. I, I you, you made an interesting point that I almost chuckled at. You said Chuck Clark's probably better than any safety they have outside of Marcus Epps. And, while I like Marcus Epps and he's had a good camp, I'm not even sure that Chuck Clark's not better than Marcus Epps. I mean, he's he's been a starter for a couple of years and he's a yeah. versatile player. And, you know, Marcus Epps still has to prove that he can do that. So it's uh, it's sort of interesting that something hasn't been done there, I, I think. you know. Well, again, but, you, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I, ideally, you would have liked something to happen in the offseason. I mean, offseason, like, May. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> I don't know. I'm a little baffled, but... Uh, we we learned a lot we a lot of intel from practice folks. This is this is the beauty of being here. Then talking to some people and and getting background on what we saw and stuff. It was a very interesting day. I I don't know. I we're going to do a show in about a week of my my camp tour, mm -hmm. and this this was an interesting practice because sometimes Jeff, as you know, going to these practices as you have for years, you go in, you don't know what you're going to see. Oh, we saw our friend Rick Spielman there. It was good to see Rick. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna try to get Rick on real quick. By the way, uh, and how about this one? This is interesting. He interviewed Howie Roseman for CBSSports.com. How about that? Yeah, I can. I'm looking forward What's to seeing that? that. Has that come out yet? I didn't see it. I'm no, because Rick told me it's weird. Like you know, I was talking to Rick. He said, "Hey, I gotta go." I'm like, "Okay." So I see him talking to Howie, and then he, Rick's holding the mic. <laughs> He's interviewing. <Mike. laughs> so I said, "Rick, what do you guys talk about?" He goes. Oh, we talked a little bit about the quarterback position. I was like, oh, okay. Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So, because they have two first round picks next year. So, the, Rick is becoming right. the media guy all of a sudden. All so. right. So, let's talk a little bit about the practice because, yes. um, as exciting as it was, it would have been, could have been more exciting if all the starters, and look, at this point, three or four weeks in a camp, no team has complete 100% health, but. Yeah. Both teams were missing some several key players. Uh, for the Eagles, Miles Sanders remained out with a hamstring. Jason Kelsey remains out after having the shoulder surgery. Or, I'm sorry, elbow, elbow sur yeah. surgery. Yeah. And Javon Hargrave uh, has also been out for a while now with that toe injury. I, I swear, Javon and, and, and preseason slash training camp has just never been a good thing in his Eagles tenure. But um, his, his seasons have been fine regular seasons it's just the preseason does not go well for him with the injuries yeah so the the ones that uh we, we've talked ad nauseum about Sanders we don't have to talk much about it I mean they, they right. just need ready for week one right. well, two years ago he had a we were told uh grade two hamstring strain and they didn't seem concerned about it but the thing with hamstring strains is and the reason why they held him out and this is two years ago I don't remember all of it but I just remember talking to someone close to the situation they didn't want it to linger because of his history of he's a younger player two years ago mm -hmm. uh, in his second year. And they just did not want this to linger all season. Now, this one we're hearing, it's not, not that it was severe two years ago, but it's not as bad, I guess you could say. This or, is a or, toe though, right? His new. No, 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 no. Hamstring. We're talking Sanders, 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 Sanders. Oh, Miles. Sanders. I'm sorry. I, I thought you were yeah. still on Hargrave. Okay. No, no, no. We're talking Sanders. Gotcha. So, but two years ago, we were concerned about, or they were concerned about how long it would linger. So they held him out the first week. Mm -hmm. I get it, because he didn't have a history of showing that he could play through injury yet. And quite frankly, year four, still not sure if he could play, if he, he's shown that ability to, to play. I get hamstrings, you know, for running back, you know, it could be troublesome, but 
this is you know part of the reason why he doesn't have an extension is because he just doesn't stay on the field enough. And I know he bristled and was not happy when people were saying he's injury prone. Well, mm-hmm. look, it is what it is. We know he built his body up. He's trying. We're not criticizing him for not for, for anything else other than he keeps getting hurt with these kind right. of things. Right. They don't have great depth at running back, man. They, they, they don't. You know? They haven't had it um, all camp, and yet they really haven't made moves there. In fact, that the one guy that they did sign, DeAndre Torrey, was part of the guys who were waived uh, earlier this week. So they're they're seemingly content to go with what they've got for now. We'll see if uh, they address that position. You know, as we've talked about uh, down at the waiver cut cut line or deadline. Um, but yeah, and, J- and Javon Hargrave with the toe, Adam. I mean, two years ago he missed almost all of camp with the pec injury followed by the hamstring injury. I think last year he missed a little time with something as well. It wasn't as long, but now he's been out with the toe and, you know, you just like to see him get back, back to practice uh, soon to make sure that, you know, it's all right. Yeah. Uh, Josh Joe was wearing a good traction on his elbow. He didn't practice on Wednesday. We need to keep right. an eye on that. Right. Uh, J- Josiah Scott's the hamstring. So he grabbed his leg when he got hurt in the game. You hobbled off. And this is this is particularly troublesome. We don't know how long it's going to be because he's been one of the really bright spots of camp for their secondary. And he's going to be a hybrid player for them, a free safety slash uh slot corner uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and specials. And this is a this is a, a guy they really wanted to take a look at. And they they got an extended look and they like what they saw. And credit to him for being able to show the versatility and then. He has this injury, so this complicates the matter here. So we'll we'll, we'll get a further word for. Uh, actually, we may do a special show later today. Uh, it's Thursday. If, mm-hmm. if we if Jeff and I have time, we might update some stuff, injuries, and uh, give you because we'd rather not have to wait till Monday to get this up. You know, the game will be on Saturday. We'd we'd like to get you an update if we can fit it in. Yep. Yep. Uh, but then the good news. This is the good. Some good news and some slightly concerning news. So Bradbury did. Very light work on the side. Uh, he did some work. He got in some light work, some dr- light drills, but he didn't do any teamwork. So with his groin injury, so that's good. He's back on the field. Yep. But Slay on one on one, and I saw it happen because it was 15, 20 feet in front of me. He grabbed, like he, he, uh, he was going against Tyreek Hill, I think, on one on ones, and he, he, he sort of like pulled up yep. a little bit on the leg, and then he came back got some reps and then left and didn't finish. We'll see if he works today, but we have to keep an eye on it. But the good news, of all this negative injury news is uh, Bradbury's starting to work back, so that's good. Yep, that is good. Now, I was standing right next to you with the Slay um, when he, he first got injured. And so what I think may have, and, you know, sort of speculation, but educated. So you saw him pull up a little bit on that play. It was the first play of seven on sevens and Tyree Kill. Um, clean beat him on a nine route down the right sideline for a night. Yeah. Tyreek Hill, by the way, we'll get into that, is a is a heck of a practice player along with a game. I mean, he gives it all in practice. So it's it's always good to see a guy who gets his money and has Pro Bowl still go out there and give everything he's got. Well, he's 101, though, on 101, he grabbed his leg. I mean, I he might have done it also in seven on seven, but so I don't know. Maybe that? that? Uh, Slack, my bad. Yeah, yeah. No, I was getting to that. I was just yeah. giving Tyreek Hill some props. I, I mean, he, he beat Slay before Slay grabbed his leg. I know. It's unbelievable. I, dude, so, he, you good? Yeah, so I was just going to say the, the, they took another rep on the other side of the field about a minute, you know, less than that, later, and Tyreek beat him on a, a, a route that was really not something you'd ever see in an NFL game because he put about three different moves on Slay. <laughs> And Tua just stood there and waited for him to get open and then threw him the ball. So I, I would actually say that's a win for Slay that it took so long. But on that play, Tyreek put a couple of, you know, vintage Tyreek moves on. And that's the play. I believe it was after that play is when Slay left and said, that's it for, for practice. So <laughs> he may have heard it on the first play, but that second time that he had to follow Tyreek Hill, he may have exacerbated it because of, of, uh, <laughs> you know, all the moves that he put on. So to, just on what you said two weeks ago, I was at Bucks camp. He turned, Carlton Davis is really a good corner for the Bucks, totally inside out. I'm just trying to think of, I just can't remember another receiver doing something like that before. You know, they, his nickname's the Cheetah, but yes, he's the f- most explosive receiver in the league. 
but his route running his ability to get in and out of breaks is just absurd. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of like Antonio Brown, but he's obviously much faster. It just, it was just remarkable. I, I, this is only the second time we saw him up close. Or I've seen him up close. Then we saw him destroy the Eagles last year. What was it like 11 for 180 or something and three oh touchdowns? Oh my God. Yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> He, he's he's really good. Uh, if anybody thought that Tyreek Hill was just a product of the Kansas City offense, they're really really wrong. He's really good. <laughs> he, is, he, is, Russell. he is the best change of direction I think I've ever seen in a wide Agreed. receiver. I mean, it's just so naturally. That's what I mean. Hundred yeah. percent. You, you got yeah. it. I, I don't know. I just. It's why I love going to practice because you get such a better view from what, than watching it on TV, or even even coaching tape. Mm-hmm. But seeing it live is a game changer. And the nice thing about practice is we're able to get up very, very close. So you, you learn more about that. And you, we've said since we since Slay's been here that, yes, bigger receivers can give him problems because he's because they're bigger guys who are stronger, like Metcalf and some others. But mm-hmm. Tyree Cook is everyone problems. So this is no shame at all for Slay. Yeah. But uh, McPherson, boy, Zach McPherson got a ton of reps. We'll get into that as well. Yeah, we will. All right, let's. Um, oh, so we'll hope to, we'll see if Slay is able to practice Thursday, and then from there we'll give you further updates on on how he's doing. Uh, we'll get into the notes in a second. I just want to uh, direct your attention to our friends at FreestoneFarmsCBD.com. If you go, it's the best CBD on the market. If you use the promo code ITB, you'll get twenty percent off at checkout that's promo code itb to get 20 percent off checkout on freestonefarmscbd.com all right so let's start this off uh, first of all adam we should probably tell people who have not seen this or been there that the miami dolphins have probably one of the nicest most state-of-the-art facilities now uh, this is the first year of it right Second, it's actually the second. Oh, second year of it. It's yep. beautiful. It's pristine. Yep. Two gorgeous fields. Uh, it's called the Baptist Training Health Center. They have a even better indoor sort of. I guess that's where they go when the, when it's raining. But it's a uh, it's it's enormous. It's state of the art. It's got everything you want. It's a really nice place to to watch practice. And they have huge bleachers there for fans to go and and watch. And it's and it's covered, which is where you and I eventually had to uh, had to hover over to, to just to get a little breeze there and, and cool exactly. off. <laughs> 20 but degrees it's right, it's right next to the stadium so that, that makes it oh yeah it's in good. back of it right so, so if you for those caddyshack fans their old stadium was in davie florida very close to where part of caddyshack was filmed at yes. rolling hills country club which i've been to before i visited uh so yeah it it's interesting i this is i can't believe this is true but they would know so one of the pr guys told me that believe us or not They've not had to use the indoor practice facility in the summer, which is think about all the pop-up storms they get. Wow. And as you know, in Florida, a storm could come in any time. It could be beautiful, and then the thing comes on with the damn humidity. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the weather.com app, which is what I use when I travel. I'm a crazy weather nut. And the, you know, the 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 real temperature, what it feels like was 103. So to give you folks an idea and and to a Tungo Bailoa, the quarterback for the Dolphins was talking about this, though he wasn't really asked specifically about the Eagles travel schedule. He had mentioned how the Eagles could have used an excuse. I know you mm-hmm. talked about this on Twitter of the, of playing Sunday, coming home Sunday night, mm-hmm. being home one day, then leaving their flight was somewhere, I think like five o'clock on Tuesday or something. And you, it's even way hotter than we were in. Um, you know, I was there in uh, Brea, Ohio last week. It was actually really nice, low eighties, but not, death death uh, weather like it is here in florida and i kind of think they're worn out here and th- this is you know another point people keep asking us whether they should play the starters that's up to them but i i just don't know why they would yeah uh, with, with all this work right yeah i would think so i i don't think it you know i'm I'm sort of at the point where you didn't play him much in the first you played him a little bit in the first preseason game you didn't play them at all in the second preseason game What's the point of getting him out? We joke about the time that Andy Reid put the first team offense out there, ran two plays. Donovan was incomplete on third play, and then they took the so Donovan basically went and played a game, and the only thing was throw one pass. And it was ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I don't. Who needs that? What, what 
what Andy said is he wanted to touch grass. You get the feel oh, of it. I'm like, what? I love Andy, but I mean, come on. What does that even mean? <laughs> he wanted to touch the grass. I just, I, it was one of these things like, I just don't understand the risk mm -hmm. of doing that. I know I'm, I'm sure all old school personnel guys will tell me that I'm wrong. You don't understand. You didn't play. You know, okay, fine. But is it really worth the risk of, of, of your start quarterback getting hurt? Because you don't want to look back. And, and I remember when Belichick in 09 played Wes Walker in Houston, they'd already had their seed. Uh, in fact, it's on that football life or whatever that you might have been the year that they followed the Patriots in 09. But anyway, mm -hmm. so he's like, we're going to rest Moss. We're going to play Welker. And then Welker tears his ACL. And again, it meant absolutely nothing. So right. look, you can get hurt anytime, but you, you want to minimize the risk. Right. So just to give the, our listeners an idea of how we were visualizing it, um, we're sitting in a media section of the bleachers and there's two fields. The closest one to us on Wednesday featured the Eagles defense versus the Dolphins offense. And then the further field, the one behind it was Eagles offense versus Dolphins defense. And so for us, and you did a better job of it than me. I was kind of keeping my eyes on the close field. You were looking a little bit more at the far field, but still it was a little bit more difficult to see the Eagles offense because it was the far field. And, you know, if there was a pack or things happened, it was hard to get a receiver. The jer the receivers who wear their jerseys like half up, you know, oh. uh, make it even tougher to figure what out. Who they are. Yeah. It's really difficult. It's really, really tough. It sucks. I got and. I know some of the beat reporters, they're absolutely right. They complain about the numbers are sometimes hard to see. Like the mm -hmm. eight and nine of the green jerseys when we're, they're at Novacare, unless you're got unless you've got your glasses you could bring it in. If you're if you're 100, 200 feet away, sometimes you can't tell which number it is. Right. So it's uh because Zach Pascal will talk about he kept he made play after play. Boy, he's I mean, what a recover he's made from food poison. My goodness gracious, he has not let up. He he's making. Uh, I looked up his contract. Uh, it's one point five million fully guaranteed at signing. That's going to be a bargain. It sounds like a lot for a backup receiver, but he's good because he's going to play a pivotal role as a backup and everything they're going to ask him to do. He's kicked absolute ass these last two weeks. He he's he had a phenomenal practice on on Wednesday. Hey, you know, I didn't mean to go off the tangent off the rails here, but you're bringing up a good point because it it feels like it has been a long time since the Eagles had a, a, a good backup receiver. I mean, you can go back to 2017 and say Mac Hollins was a good number four receiver because he actually had some pretty big catches, but they all seemed to it's come Washington. in blowouts. Yeah. yeah they, they were, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of the last time the Eagles pulled, like, a guy off the bench, and he was, you know, pretty reliable. I guess Paul Turner in 16 – when he got called up, he was given the meaning, meaningful snaps, but they were a bad team. I don't know. It's it's Pascal was definitely going to be one of their better backups that they've but had. But did Turner do while. anything though? Did he catch ball? I don't even remember. Oh, I bet if you go look at, I mean, okay. if we go look at 2016 Eagles receiving stats, remember how bad the receivers were there? They're terrible. You know, it's so funny you mentioned this because I'm thinking uh, at practice on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. and we're, we're sitting, Jeff and I were sitting next to each other and watching. And when there was a lull, there weren't many. I, I'll say that the, the another thing is these practices these days go quickly. They don't waste a lot of time. There might be a minute, after two minutes between um, a set of plays, as they're because they they're all by period. There might be thirteen mm -hmm. or fourteen periods. So I'm thinking, my gosh, one to five. They're really good at receiver. I, I just couldn't remember in my mind. I wasn't looking at a chart. When's the last time you look at the Eagles receiver core? They have depth and they're all talented. It's just yeah, even Rager is not even the even Rager is not even in the rotation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy was a first round pick. We, we know it hasn't happened for him, but the fact of the matter is, it's a pretty solid group, and they've got versatility. They, they've got explosiveness, and the other thing that they have, mm -hmm. and this is the other part of Zach Pascal. God, does he play through contact well? He is not. You're not stopping this guy running around like you. you you're gonna have to mug him because it, it ain't gonna happen. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. He's very strong, very physical. And I think camp is like perfect for a guy like him because he's always given max effort. He's a leader. He's a reliable guy. So it's it's kind of his time to shine. You get into the regular season and you can defend Zach Pascal in the regular season. But in, in these camps with the one-on-ones where he's savvy, he's he's got just some Jason Avant in him. I mean that as a compliment. Mm -hmm. I really mm -hmm. do. I think he's just 
has a deeper understanding when he's out there of leveraging how to get open, using his hands, using his body. We've seen him make a couple of shielded uh, body shield catches. So he does have a little Avante in him. I think that that's probably a good a good way to put it. Right. Just what I want to add is, though, when he gets in the regular season, it's not like he's going to get matchup the best corner. He's going to get a third or fourth corner. Yeah. So his matchups will probably – he'll have matchups that he can win. Yep. Well, this is, you know, triple-A baseball here. He needs to get to the majors. Mm-hmm. We have to see him do it. But he's been a red zone guy. Where he's, where he's done his damage has been in the red zone. I know he blocks well for the run game, which is important. But it just looks like they – and I know we're not in the regular season yet, but the guys that they've signed and added, they, it looks, looks like a pretty good group here. Yeah, definitely. All right. Also, along the lines of giving the listeners what they need to do, this practice was mostly move the ball, meaning there, there was not a lot of situational football. I don't think there was any red zone. I don't remember seeing any uh, goal line. I don't think there was any specific work on yeah, third right. down. Right. Yeah. So I imagine that third. They did third down. I mean, they did hurry up. They did two minute. But I, I did see hurry up and two minute. But I think they do that at the end of every practice. But yeah, but, right. But I didn't see. I didn't really see. You know, now you mention it, I didn't see a lot of red zone, if at all. Did, did we uh, see- I'm guessing Thursday today when we go to practice, mm-hmm. that will probably be the emphasis more okay. situational. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing. Yeah. I don't know, but yeah. usually that's what they talk about with the work that they want to get in in these yeah. practices. Sure. So, and uh, so. Gainwell was definitely the hurry up. He, he, he yeah, he, as expected. We all knew that would probably be the case, and he was. Yeah, and then I would say, you know, I think we both agree the Dolphins looked like the the better team in the practice. They were faster. They were sharper. I think they executed both offensively and defensively better. You know, again, we just talked about some of the the reasons that even Tua Tungo Vailoa mentioned could be legit excuses for the Eagles with the travel and playing game and the heat that they have to get adjusted to. But there's no doubt about it. When we summarized it, the Dolphins were the better team uh, on Wednesday. And we'll, again, try to do something Thursday to kind of get you an idea of what happened there. Um, so let's talk about individuals specifically. So wider, let's quarterbacks. Um, from Jalen Hurts, what I think we both observed fairly is that because of the defense Miami was playing, which was they were putting a ton of guys at scrimmage, they were blitzing, they were showing blitz and dropping. I mean, they're doing a lot of creative stuff. So we mostly saw from the Eagles offense, I would say dump downs, check downs. I think the ball went in the air deep maybe one or two times Devonte smith got targeted deep once but for the most part adam um just not a whole lot there I, it seemed like the whole whole point for the eagles quarterbacks was like okay we got to get get rid of this ball they're, they're they're bringing a lot of stuff at us this is really good though if i'm the eagles coaches i'm really glad that they face this defense they play a completely different 34 than the eagles do the eagles run the, the new england 34 which is a ton of pre-step movement mm-hmm. uh they'll do what's called a walk around a walk around is pre-snap. You don't know where the line, you don't know where the linebackers who are standing up are going to be. They'll move them around the formation. The Patriots used it against the Vikings. They'd never shown it before on tape. So the, 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 the dolphins were doing a ton of stuff and they put up pre-snap and I couldn't imagine being Hertz because you're not you, the, the Gannon 34, which has got some Fangio in it and other, other, mixes of, of schemes or thoughts mm-hmm. it, it, I'm like wow I didn't I've not seen the Dolphins up close like this and you could click because we had a great vantage point you could see it they're doing and then right before the snap <laughs> drop four guys out and then you got a three-man front it's and even the three-man front they got one overhang and they might have two linemen two two down sometimes mm-hmm. three down one up mm-hmm. like, like the Eagles do so it was fascinating I loved uh, what they were doing Definitely. And so, you know, the, the positive I would take away from that is that you worry about confusion and turnovers, but Jalen Hurts, to, to, I don't believe I saw him throw an interception. There was one pass that was close to being a guy. Yeah, well, we'll get to him in a second. But um, yeah, Jalen Hurts himself, I thought, did a good job protecting the football, even when things weren't going great for the offense. And there were some, there were some times where he does the, you know, how when they want to run the zone read, and he puts the, the ball in the, the running back's belly, but he's kind of holding it there and seeing yep. if he wants to. That's a difficult play to run against a blitz because that extra second lets the defense get. And they, and they got caught a few times trying to do that, and the outcome wasn't pretty. But, again, no fumble, no interception. 
and many times a check down or a dump off. I thought Minshew did a nice job. He had a couple of connections with, um, was it Calcaterra? Calcaterra and also Zach Pascal. That was his. Pascal, uh, right. right. Uh, but, okay, a couple things on that before we get to defense. That I know it's, you brought up the guys I want to talk about. So let Devontae Smith, by the way, looked great again. He he was mm-hmm. the one guy of the 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 ones. Uh, they they checked down a Goddard, but uh, and Devontae Smith got, he won downfield a little bit. Pascal won with the second unit, mm-hmm. uh, playing through contact. Clearly could see it. And the, uh, the the funny the. It, he got some balls 25, 20, 25 yards downfield. That was interesting uh, from uh, Minshew who had a very good practice. Now, because I, mm-hmm. I really, on Wednesday, I just wanted to concentrate on the Eagles offense versus Dolphins D, and I'm going to watch today. I'm going to watch the Eagles defense versus the Dolphins, although I would peek at the Dolphins offense. But it's interesting. Tua and Minshew are similar in that they don't have strong arms. In fact, uh, Hurts clearly has a stronger arm than uh, – uh, than uh, Tua, mm-hmm. not it doesn't have a gun, obviously, but he has a stronger arm. And when you don't have a strong arm, you have to win with anticipation. And Mi- you could see with Minshew, as you were talking, alluded to, Calcaterra got some great catches over the middle. Boy, and yeah. you really see what the Eagles saw on tape. He is explosive. He right. really is explosive. He's good for the RPO game. I think mo- those back-to-back catches he had came off the RPOs. Right, they were right over the middle, right down the seam, which is what you want in this t- sort of quasi west coast offense Mm -hmm. uh so that was good Uh, and the good thing is because the dolphins threw all sorts of stuff at them yeah they had some issues on their offensive line with a blitz but they've got that tape because teams more often not run their stuff in joint practice they don't run it in the games they don't want any you know they don't want it on real tape where all the other 30 teams could see it Mm -hmm. so this is good. Well, th- this is the kind of good work that you want. You want, you know, it's it's nothing wrong with getting beat because you adjust to it. Because you, you, you want to, you're seeing a defense, A, they're not on their schedule in the regular season. B, this is some of the derivatives of the Patriots people. Uh, the Raiders uh, will, will probably run a little bit. Patrick Graham's got some mm-hmm. because Patrick Graham co- is from the Belichick tree. Uh, they're, not play- they're not playing the Raiders this year, though, I don't think. But no, he wasn't some other guys in the league might. Um, so it, it's just good to get it different looks, and this is why you do it. Yeah, definitely. And so to finish it off with quarterbacks, you know, we, we felt Reed's net struggle. And I know there were a couple of interceptions on his part. Um, you know, this was, again, it was a very aggressive defense. I don't know how much of it he was prepared for. So it's going to happen. But he just didn't – he didn't look particularly sharp in the uh, in the – the the team drills that I recall, yeah, he he uh, he definitely has the pop in the arm. That's not going to be a problem. But he he got even as a backup running with third team. He got he got pressured. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So so I, I think you you look at it and understand it for your Eagles coach staff before we get the defense. You'll you'll have to adjust to this. Now you've seen it. Uh, not that they didn't know because Josh Boyer was who was the D coordinator was the D coordinator. Under Brian Flores, and they're both from the Belichick tree, so they probably had some intel knowing what m- they might see. They probably got more than they expected, so they'll have to adjust. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, I, I wouldn't. I wrote this on the InsideTheBirds.com observations piece because I feel like some people were asking, like, "Well, what's going on? Is the offensive line doing a bad job?" I think maybe some reporters felt that way. I don't know, but you know, it, when you're bringing that many people as Miami was at times. When you bring more than five, then it's not always on the offensive line. You've got running backs, you've got tight ends, and your quarterback has to know when they're bringing more than five that he's got to get rid of the ball. And usually there's a one-on-one matchup somewhere to find if the other team is blitzing. So this wasn't all on the offensive line. I don't want um, people to think that because there was a lot of pressure that the O-line did not hold up well against Dolphins D. It was just a very, you know, a very aggressive defense and a very – to the flip side of that, we watched the Eagles defense against Miami's offense, and we that was closer to us. And while we could say that Jonathan Gannon ran multiple fronts and he did some movement on the back end, it wasn't nearly as as much concocted pressure as what Miami was doing to Philadelphia. Correct. Yeah. In fact, uh, they because of their safeties left room in the middle, they got crushed in the seam. Not mm-hmm. just by tight ends, it was receivers. It was tight ends. 
Yeah. Uh, and it, it was really fun that you and I looked at each other because it was at the very start. We're like, oh boy, this is interesting. Because mm-hmm. they played a lot of two, two, two shell and yeah. they got hit. I um, mean, they got hit in the middle. Uh, remember now, uh, so Bradbury didn't work. And in, in he was very limited. He just started working back. So one of your, your started corners was out. McPherson got a ton of snaps. Mm-hmm. And so it was Harris and Epps. Wallace was with the second team. And I'm seeing, I'm just envisioning what happened. So it seemed like, right, it seemed like they, they didn't really tighten up the, the safeties a bit. It seemed like there was a lot of room for most of the practice. Yeah, there was also room in the flats. Tua did, oh, yeah. a, did a good job of sort of yeah. getting his outlets, whether they were running backs or tight ends, just in the flats. We've talked about that with the defense that the Eagles are running. When they have overhang defenders who ordinarily on other 3-4 teams have both rush and cover responsibilities, that's going to be difficult for the Eagles because guys like Reddick and Sweat are, are not rush and cover guys. They're rush guys. So I think there was uh, one snap where we saw Hassan Reddick had a drop into coverage and Tua had an easy completion there on the left side. I think it was to Gasicki, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't remember. Uh, but either way, that that is certainly the challenge that I think awaits Jonathan Gannon in the regular scene is how to defend certain areas of the field that might be exposed because of the style of defense they play and the personnel that they're using to play it. Yeah, they, you picked it up early in that practice. There were a bunch of checkdowns and outlets where mm-hmm. uh, they left a void, and they had the the uh, the the back or the tight end had had uh, room to run there. Yeah. So that's just something. Look, this is this is good. I, I wouldn't be alarmed. This is exactly what you want. You want to see different schemes, and not that anyone wants to see the team get beat, your defense, but this is good tape for you to get because you. You see what teams are trying to do to you. This is exactly what you want to learn. This is why you want them to run their stuff against you, their your, their, their schemes. Uh, with Mike McGain to run the Kyle Shanahan scheme, his version of it, mm-hmm. and you know they're going to they're going to be heavy. They're going to be he- a lot of twelve because uh, that's what the the Niners do. And you just uh, you, you want to see what they do. And, the, and by the way, the Devils don't have a very good offensive line. And the Eagles right. did get some pressure on, on Tua, but the thing that he does, like I was talking about with Gardner Minshew, that that back foot hits the ground, that ball's out, man. He doesn't hesitate at all. No, yeah, but, he had good timing and rhythm with his receivers. He did a good absolutely. day. He did a good day. Yeah. So there's so many, a couple of people in particular I want to get to, um, including Hassan Reddick. You mentioned him. Also, with Bradbury, Slay, and Josh Job out, you saw a lot of reps at outside corner for Zach McPherson and Mac McCain. Was it, was it Kerry Vincent? No, I think it was Mac McCain who was out, was the opposite corner. I mean, I'm sure guys rotated, but those were the ones I remember seeing. So we'll talk about that in a second. First, I want to remind everybody to check out our friends at phlsportsnation.com. They're enhancing the fans' experience with their coverage of all Philadelphia sports teams for the fan, by the fan is their motto, so make sure you check them out at phlsportsnation.com. And let's pause real quick for another word from our great sponsors, including our friends at Sky Motor Cars. And if you hop into Sky Motor Cars out there in Westchester, PA, make sure you tell them Adam and Jeff sent you. You will get a great deal. So Adam, Hassan Reddick. I loved what I saw, not just not just because he's a good pass rusher, but Jonathan Gannon moved him around. And we talked about the importance of you can't just line this guy up over a tackle 40 times a game and expect that he's going to beat that guy. Well, he's got to be a movable piece. And in some regards, he was almost like a joker. You know, the old Jim Johnson mm-hmm. joker. They, they funneled him all around the, uh, the defense. And that was good to see. He, he created pressure. Oh, they had one where Teron Jackson got in there and he cleaned he cleaned it up, and mm-hmm. then uh, Reddick just he kind of like was in the middle and he he just it was like a funnel he just jumped, it's pretty cool yeah and because mm-hmm. I think that Reddick uh, when he was interviewed locally last over uh, maybe a couple weeks ago he talked about how much he loved the way they're using him which which was encouraging because I know some people. When they see the reporters tweet that Reddick is in coverage, they go, oh, no, this is ridiculous. You shouldn't be covering anyone and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. 
there's no linebacker in the National Football League who's in who's rushing the passer on every down. That just doesn't happen. Right. You can't just not have the guy in coverage, but you obviously want to limit that. You're paying him 50 million a year to rush the quarterback, and he'll do that. Yeah, yeah. The, there was that one play I think you just referenced where I believe there was a safety blitzing up the middle, up the A gap, and he looped around right and followed the safety and had a free path to the quarterback. Clearly, that was a protection scheme breakdown from Miami's point because they could not have anticipated that and the Eagles did a really good job of exploiting it and he was so fast up the middle on Tua that there wasn't even or it was might have been Bridgewater but there wasn't even a throw it was just one of those up your sack done called so oh yeah that's right so you can't hit the quarterback so they just you, you'll call like they'll stop the play but you would call that a sack that's what the coaches would tell you right uh so it was a fun day, man. It, by the way, it was two hours, just, just about maybe a little slightly less than two hours. Yeah, it was a little slick because it started at 12.15. A mm-hmm. little bit under two hours. Today's is supposed to be under two hours. And uh, that that will conclude. But yeah, there were fans there with this one. But what the, because kids now are going back to school in some parts of the country. And I think in Miami, the PR staff said some of the schools are in down session mm-hmm. that the crowds that they were getting and they're a little bit down. I do wonder if they'll be there today. That'll be interesting. I do too. Now there was a little bit of chippiness on Wednesday. It wasn't much. 20 seconds. seconds. (laughs) It was between Landon Dickerson and Jalen Phillips. And by the way, the weirdest thing ever, and it's a cool thing, but I didn't know until after practice. So Jalen Phillips from Miami, second year pass rusher, pass rusher out of Miami, had a good year last year. He was wearing an orange jersey while everybody else was wearing a white jersey for the Dolphins. He had an orange jersey on. So I'm like, is he hurt? Is there something like you can't add it? So apparently what the Dolphins do is if you have a really good practice and you were practice player of the day, you get to wear the orange jersey the next day and you get to pick the musical playlist for practice. So that's the only way I knew it was him fighting Landon Dickerson because it was the big orange oh, jersey. Orange. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you were bringing it up, and I'm thinking, I, I don't, other than I know orange is part of their color scheme, I don't know what, what, yeah, no. what it mean. Now, <laughs> the, mu- the music, to start practice, I didn't notice. Did you notice anything about the music? Nothing, yeah, just hip hop, you know. Yeah, 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 I don't, I don't but, know. But, but apparently uh, that was his playlist, so he got to pick the playlist. Cool. Very cool. A um, couple of individual notes. Tay Gowan still struggling. I struggle in the sevens. I know seven on sevens are not conducive to cornerbacks, but yes, man, I, I just don't, you know, I know he was a six round pick that they traded for, but I remember being told that they kind of liked him. They, they almost mm-hmm. considered drafting him in the six round. Yes. I think they had, I think they had higher hopes for him. I know he's again, mm-hmm. you're just a six round pick, but um Quez Watkins is a six-round pick, and he's starting to come into to his own. Oh, yeah. So, he's, he's, yeah. he's got a clearly defined role. That that one's going to work out. Didn't look good early, but he's done a great job of turning his career around. Oh, also, we rarely talk about special teams, but it's still a kick returner by committee. They don't know who it is yet. They're, they're, they're rolling in a bunch of guys. It, well, let's put it this way. They whittled down from working in eight guys down to four. Right. Uh, punt returner, will, if, it'll be the Rager or um, – uh, the, the undrafted kid from Utah. Bring Covey. Yeah, Covey. Uh, my money would be on Covey, but I know that Rager's... Uh, the good thing about Rager, I'll say this much, he's not dropping the ball at all. And he actually returned well in practice on Wednesday. But the thing is, you're not tackling. It, it's just... It, it's hard to tell how... Because you're stopping the play. Like, he'll get through the line and they stop the play. Well, right. I don't know how far he would have gotten. So how, how could I say it would have been a 50-yard return? I, I right. Know. Right. Don't discount Quez Watkins, by the way, you know, as a kick return. He, did, he had a nice kickoff return. He had a yeah, nice. I mean, he he's he's firmly in the mix there. So they've got some, hey, man, it's good that they just have good options because it's been kind of a sore spot for them for a little while. No, oh, look, it's it, it the return game has been such a disappointment. Rager's, Rager was the most dynamic returner in 2019 at TCU. I don't know what the hell's happened with him as a return. I, I can't put my finger on it. Mm-hmm. It's just hard to understand. Uh, and that was the one area where you thought that at the very least, if he struggled at receiver, he'd be able to be a great returner, a good returner. So mm-hmm. they wouldn't have, they'd have that solved. And that's still up in the air. The punt return game still not good enough. Kickoffs looks a little better because we're seeing some more explosive returns, but the return game, the coverage has not been quite up to snuff. 
Uh, the kicker's terrific. Uh, they did a good job mm -hmm. getting him uh, corrected and fixed, as they say, last year. Mm -hmm. But special teams aren't special yet. They need to get there. Didn't Britton Covey have a kickoff return as well? Like, isn't he? Didn't he practice with the kickoff return unit? Yes, he is. No, he definitely yeah. is. Yeah, he's part of that four. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's Dion came by who still makes plays. He's another guy that deserves to be on this roster. Yep. They're going to have some numbers, man. This is going to be, we're going to probably take, oh yeah, we'll tape our 53 show from we'll, we'll, that'll drop Monday. I'm struggling with this one. I already have like 45 and the last, I got pretty much 48, but the last yeah. five I'm struggling with. There seems to be a surge of fans who think that it would be a travesty if Jalen Rager made the team, but Deion Kane didn't. I see. That. And I think that Deion is starting to reach that sort of cult fan status, you know, like Henry Josie and uh, <laughs> you know other no, guys. Nothing, nothing will no, I know ever nothing reach will ever that. Compare to, compare that compared to Henry Josie. But. I would say the biggest hype machine from training camp. Josie's number one. Hank Basket is a very close one A. I mean, he well, he was phenomenal. Yeah, he would make it the team. Yeah, uh, our 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 good buddy uh, Rashid Bailey. Yeah, he, he would he that was legit. He was the best receiver of the one the right. one year. Right, Thank Lorenzo you. Booker, the Greg Salas. <laughs> but the thing I wanted to say is that trying to work for a preseason game. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great to pull for him, and but the whole like idea that oh they're they're, they're crazy. If they, I mean. Even if he made the fifty-three, he's just—he's not going to play unless there's significant injuries. Right? He, he's behind AJ Brown. He's behind Devontae Smith. He's going to be behind Zach Pasco. He's going to be behind Quez Watkins. So, the sure. idea that you—if you think he deserves to be on the team and then you think he's going to play, no, he's not going to play. This, these bottom roster spots are about special teams and sort of positional versatility. So, I, I wouldn't get your heart, you know, set into this the fifth or sixth wide receiver and think it's some kind of travesty if he doesn't make the team. So I mean, you, what, I, I'd almost say, what are you pulling for? Cause you're never going to see the guy on the field. And if you do, it's because a lot of guys got hurt and that's a bad and, 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 and honestly, if Rager's on the team, he'll never play. He's not going to, he's no, he's no role. That's okay. the thing. When I go to these practices, I'm like, he has no role. Yeah. They might run it. They might work him in the second team and it'll, he'll rotate with Pascal, yep. but he just doesn't have a role. So they're exactly. so good at they're so good at receiver for the first time. I don't know how long we'd have to research it. Maybe eighteen, and right. in fact, I would argue they're almost deeper. And they've got guys who can run. They got guys who are physical. That it's the first time they've got everything you're kind of looking for. More size. They have speed, toughness, which we've we've in terms of playing through contact. We've questioned that for a while. Now they have that. Covey, if he if he makes it, which he should, he may. Proved to be a decent slot receiver over time. Give, give a little different look than Quez as a vertical slot. It, Kobe will be more possession slot. So they've got, they've got a lot going on here, man. This is a good job by their, their pro personnel, their, their scout, college scouting department. It's mm -hmm. been a good – it's not just everybody wants to give the GM credit, and I understand that. But give their personnel department credit. They've done a phenomenal job of, uh, of research and getting good intel on players. And you notice the character of these guys? Yeah, we get out of here? definitely. I think it's a big, big focus of this team to make sure that for the, I mean, listen, you're always going to have a couple of guys who, who you wonder about. Um, and, and on along those lines, Adam, I meant to mention this. Quez Watkins had a press conference before practice. Oh, okay. and somebody asked him, were you, if he was upset that he had to play in the second preseason game, because as a slot receiver in the NFL, technically you're like a starter. You're playing most of the snaps. It's a slot corner. Sure. And you, sure. you know what he said? He said, you know what? I haven't earned anything. I'm a six-round pick. I haven't accomplished anything. I, I have, There's no, nothing for me to sit here and say I should be or shouldn't be that. And for a guy who, as we said, you know, kind of came into the team with some, some maturity issues that needed to be hampered out and ironed out, I think he's really come a long way. And I congratulate him. I think he is developing into not just a good physical football player, but a mature one. As well. At least that press conference showed some growth to me about him understanding his role and and accepting it and wanting to get better. So that's yeah, I, I, I yeah, I drove in. I usually get there right for practice start, so I missed that. I'm glad you brought that up. That's good stuff because two years ago, him, Fulgham, and some that that group was so young. The group yeah. and they were so immature. They needed to grow up. In fact, it was Hightower too. He's still here. Is it? By, by the way, he's had a decent camp for what we hear. 
Hmm. Uh, he's been, you know, it's sort of nondescript because he just doesn't get enough reps, but you, you got to give Quest credit because I, I, I would have told you if, if based on where he was coming to last spring, he was going to get, he was going to, as they say, shape up or ship out. I don't think he was going to make it. Had he not got himself together, I don't think he would have made the team. They no, were kind of like, hey, now or never. And he, he, he must have gotten the me- message, whatever the, whatever they, uh, uh, Aaron Moorhead and whoever else got in his ear. But he, he's really gotten it. What a nice story he's been. It really is. Definitely. And uh, he has an opportunity to have a big year here coming up in the uh, Eagles offense as the slot receiver or wherever they wind up finding his best role. All right. That's going to do it for this episode of Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles Intel. Again, we will we'll do our best to try to bring you something Thursday afternoon, just kind of wrap it all up before Saturday's preseason finale. So stay tuned, check our socials, be uh, attuned to our YouTube. It'll and be we'll YouTube. Let you know. Yeah, it'll be YouTube, right? Okay. Well, I mean, we, we will alert people with our oh, yeah. socials that, that it'll be on YouTube. Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. So look forward to that. Want to thank our producer, Hunter, uh, no, not Hunter Brody anymore. It's Tyler Strasser, and he's doing an excellent job. So thank you to Tyler Strasser. And as always, we thank you for flying with us inside the birds.